Nanette, would you come and join us real quick, please? Come on. Uh, many of you know Reverend uh, Nanette Missells. Uh, many of you know what chapel is. Many of you know that the CLW series and all that. Uh, next week is, is the last chapel of the year with baccalaureate in which we honor seniors. Today we finish up a series on Jesus and I know of no better time to focus upon the, the obedient servanthood of Christ and to honor one than this morning. Nanette uh, is retiring this year at the end of 27 years of ministry to Carson Newman. Folks, that's 27 years of chapels and CLWs and spots and everything else. We, we have something for you there by Angela. You have been our minister. You've been a model of obedient servanthood to this place, and we are truly, truly thankful. You're quite welcome. Now let us enter into worship. As we've mentioned, this is the end of a six-weeks-long six, long, six weeks long series in which we focus on Jesus. It is Holy Week. No better time to worship Him. No better preacher than David Crutchley. No better folks than Men's Chorus and Redemption to lead us. So let us enter into worship. As Sorrow, we will miss you. Thank you for gracing the banks of Moisey Creek and our corridors and church buildings with your winsome spirit and Christ-likeness. I'm going to abbreviate the reading this morning and just read from Mark chapter 15. And I'm going to pick up at verse 25 through 32. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. The scripture was fulfilled which says, And he was numbered with transgressors. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him wagging their heads and saying, Ha! Huh, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. 
In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. Cardinal Jean-Marie Lastigo became Archbishop of Paris in 1981 and retired in 2005, describes his story in one of his homilies of young boys in Orléans, France in 1939. These boys decided that they were going to have some fun and they dared each other to go into the church and to go to the confessional with a made-up list of terrible sins and to confess those sins to the priest. One of them, a Jewish boy named Aaron, was up for the challenge. He made his way to the church and made his way to the confessional and began to speak out these terrible made-up sins. But the priest was wise. The priest immediately knew what he was doing and not showing any signs of annoyance, gave him a simple penance. Go up to the altar and there before the image of the crucified Christ, kneel and utter these words, Jesus, I know you died for me, but I don't care a D. I will not say the word. Ha, thought Aaron to himself. And went up to the altar and cried out, Jesus, I know you died for me, but I don't care a D. He repeated a second time, Jesus, I know you died for me, but I don't care a D. He began to repeat it a third time, Jesus, I know you died for me, but I don't care a and he stopped. He could not continue. A year later, in August 1940, Aaron was baptized and changed his name to Jean Marie. As the cardinal finished his homily after telling that story, he said to his congregants, That boy stands before you today speaking to you. When we come to this text this morning, we hear powerful words. For it was William Villamon, past chaplain of Duke University, who asks the penetrating and provocative question of this Easter Friday, why can't God act like God? In Mark's Gospel, we find Jesus traveling incognito under the radar, in disguise, under wraps, discouraging his disciples and those whom he healed from blurting out the advertisement that Jesus is the Messiah. Even the demonic world that identifies this one called Jesus as Messiah is hushed. It is the crucifixion scene, however, where Mark's gospel comes to us and unmasks the portrait of Jesus and we catch a glimpse of a Jesus that we could never anticipate. Come with me in the early parts of the snapshots of Mark's gospel as he clips them through and we see the scene of the true crucifixion in chapter 15. In the praetorium, the Roman courtyard, behind closed walls with where there are no prying eyes, the Roman soldiers begin to make sport with this one from Galilee. With callous indifference, they play out a parody. They begin to enact a pantomime, a mockery pantomime, and part of this pantomime is the costume. For across his shoulders is a purple robe. He's dressed in purple. Perhaps the faded tunic or cloak of a Roman soldier. 
perhaps an old rug thrown across those shoulders, those bleeding shoulders that had been scourged before. That purple cloth that meant to clue out that this was wealth and those who wore that cloth were the elite. But this is an act of mockery for this Galilean peasant from Nazareth cannot be the Messiah, the ruler. The crown that is forced upon his head made of sharp thorns from the acanthus plant woven together, a mockery of the crown that the emperor would wear, that radiant laurel crown, he wears a crown of thorns. This is hardly a sign of divine kingship. The satirical drama continues in Mark 15 with more venom as they beat his head with a reed and as they spit upon him. And then in mocking obeisance, they kneel before him and they salute him as they would salute an emperor. Ave Caesar, Victor Imperator was the Roman emperor's greeting. They take those words and they mock this one, this carpenter's son from Nazareth, and they taunt him with the words, Hail the King of the Jews. They kneel down before him in an act of contempt in this cruel burlesque. Mark uses the word in his passage here, they mocked him, which suggests that they tricked him, they deceived him, they played with him like a child. And we ask the question, why won't God act like God? God's face covered with soldiers' spit. Mark continues his account of the crucifixion. We see the Simon of Serene, one of the crowd being recruited and drafted to carry the horizontal beam of Jesus' cross. No doubt he has been so weakened by the flagellation that he needs someone else to carry that cross before he stumbles meandering in a drunken gait towards Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place of death, the hill of execution. He refuses, once crucified and placed on that cross, to play the game of this charade, drinking wine mixed with myrrh. But that is not the end of the shame. For many times the Roman soldiers would strip the victim naked of his clothes, and then they would nail him to the cross. The brutal, degrading act that takes place. While the Roman soldiers huddled together, throwing ancient dice at the base of the cross. Why won't God act like God? God hanging naked on the cross. The parody continues unabated. And Jesus' crime is inscribed on a slab of wood affixed to the beam above his head. There's the titulus in Greek and Latin and in Hebrew, the king of the Jews. Hebrew, Melech, Latin, Rex. Greek, Basilius, the king of the Jews. Can you hear the scorn and the derision of Roman voices as they mock the so-called king? Continuing the jest. They provide for him two courtiers, a brigand, an insurrectionist, a guerrilla, a freedom fighter, one on the left and one on the right. These jesters, these criminals for the king. The crucifixion scene closes and it opens with mockery. For Roman power took delight in crucifying the victim in places of human gathering and traffic in public places. Mark records in the passage that I read three groups of mockers, a choir of mockers. The first, the bypassing people in the crowd who blaspheme Jesus. That's the verb that is used. They shake their heads and they blaspheme this one on the cross, this great pretender. The religious establishment, the chief priests and scribes, they come and they mock him. The criminals taunt him. The cat calls are unified in their one request. Come down for us. 
You gave us the words in your message that if the temple was destroyed, you would raise it up in three days. How hollow those words seem. Come down and show us who you are. The stinging taunt is understood by all. Every Jew knew that the anointed one, the Messiah, would overthrow the Roman powers that ruled the world. If he is really king, he should come down from the cross. But that would give them only then reason to believe, perhaps. Why won't God act like God? As N.T. Wright says, it's failed messiahs who end up on a cross. Or is it? The one on the cross hangs suspended between heaven and earth, and he is silent. No answers for his critics. No proof of deity to counter his detractors and scoffers. And he hangs on the cross while the world mocks him. Why won't God act like God? Why won't God flex his muscles and summon a retinue of 12 legions of angels? Why won't he bring an end to the humiliation and the degradation? If you are the Son of God, where are your troops? The lost temptation of Christ as he hangs silently on the cross is in essence the same one that came the way in the garden of the olive press Gethsemane some hours before. Abort the mission of God. Refuse to drink the cup of suffering. But he will not abandon the will of God. He will not walk away from the assignment to rescue humankind. He votes by his action for weakness rather than power, for vulnerability and death rather than life and security. There is no answer to the ones who ridicule him and scoff at the foot of the cross. No self-defense, no effort to get even, no last word or final word thrown at them. Not one protest, no effort to present a modicum of dignity and pride. Jesus absorbs the taunts of his mockers to prove that he was the Son of God. Jesus surrenders to the in total vulnerability, to the malevolence and violence of that world. This is how the kingdom of God God comes at last. The suffering love of God. For in Mark, Jesus nails his colors to the mast, or rather to the cross. For he defined how the Son of Man would come and rescue humankind. He would come to serve and not be served and offer up his life as a ransom for many. That is God acting like God. God comes into the theater of human history and in a language and discourse he begins to make us understand that language is Jesus. He openly declares his love for us from the cross and his intention to rescue us from the ashes of our brokenness and from the anguish of our hollow dreams and mangled lives. He steps into the breach and travels all the way to Golgotha, and Jesus acts like God. Vulnerable and alone, bereft, he offers his life for you and for me. The message is clear this morning. The divine artist has shaped and formed your life and given it breath. And he seeks today to infuse your life, my life, with new hope, new meaning, new purpose. You counter in your heart back to me this morning. You don't know my life. You don't know my life. 
how fractured and complicated it is. A life that has traveled through the acids of modernity, that has eaten the marrow of your dreams away. A life enchained by the forces of addiction and by past choices, past chosen. You are right, I don't know that. But I know that this Friday, this Friday that approaches, marks the moment in human history when God brought the possibility of rescue into our lives through the death of His Son on the cross. According to legend, a Japanese shogun, military commander of the 15th century by the name of Ashikaga Yushimasa, broke his favorite teacup one day. I have a hard time thinking of a warrior drinking out of a teacup. But he broke that favorite teacup one day and scooped up the pieces and sent them off to the Chinese porcelain artists for them to restore. They sent it back, but it was a mess. And he commissioned the Japanese artists to try to restore this teacup that he loved. Eventually it came back to him in a priced way, a precious way. All those jagged pieces had come together and they had been bound together even though they had been shattered by precious metal. The precious metal of golden, liquid gold or liquid silver brought together the teacups. This teacup. And for him this was the beginning of new joy and hope. It was the beginning of an art form in Japan that has gone on through the centuries of broken vases or vases, of broken bowls and teapots and teacups. And that to me is a message of what God says to us through the cross today. Here, let me take the broken, jagged pieces of your life and let me bring to it some symmetry, some balance. Let me place together the gold, the silver of my grace, my mercy, and my forgiveness. Who doesn't want to be forgiven today? A few weeks ago, I flew down to Louisiana and stood in the midst of one of the most notorious prisons, maximum security prisons in America called Angola. It's got a history as being probably the most bloody prison of all the penal places in this land. But the ethos has changed. This prison that holds 6,300 people where two-thirds of the prisoners and inmates are there for life. And life in Louisiana means natural life, the end of life, until the inmate dies. Ninety percent of the prisoners in Angola will never leave the premises alive. There's a man that's sentenced in that prison to 846 years of imprisonment. As I heard of how the ethos of the prison had changed by a group of prisoners who had decided that they would enroll in a seminary degree and learn how to be pastors to the prisoners. And as we met these pastors who were prisoners to the prisoners and heard their testimonies, I will not ever forget the first one, Johnny, whose first sentence out of his mouth was, I'm a first-time offender. And I've been here for 32 and a half years. I've hardly found anyone with the grace, the peace, the serenity, and the love of Christ in my life as I witnessed him speak to us. A pastor to the prisoners. A one who had enrolled in the seminary degree and now was teaching these other prisoners how to do auto, me auto mechanics was the pastor not only in living out the sermons of his life from day to day, but also the pastor in the way that he would preach to them on Sundays and teach them and love on them. Johnny, who had graduated in the early years of 2000, was asked to leave the prison 
to go as a missionary to cross that frontier of a safe prison where he'd earned his credentials and everyone knew him, to go to another prison in Louisiana and pastor to the prisoners. He went for five to eight years, cannot remember that figure, but came back into this prison. He's tried probation and parole, not probation. He's been before the board. They voted once, three out of five. You need four to leave the prison. Johnny's not worried. He comes back each day with purpose and meaning. This Jesus on the cross, if we can have reconciliation at the coalface of a maximum security prison, can it not take place anywhere? Some of the inmates have replied, We've been loved and learned to love. That's what the cross's message is to us today. Find forgiveness. You've been loved, now learned to love. Some of the prison inmates have said the next religious awakening in America will come straight through this prison system. The prisons in America are changing with the seminaries that are beginning at the coalface. As we come... To this Friday, as we tilt towards this Good Friday, let us remember that God, through His Son Jesus, has come into a dark and broken world and has brought us light and life and purpose and wholeness. Let us hear afresh and anew the words that the Father spoke to His Son at His baptism and transfiguration. You are my Son, in whom I am well pleased, delighted. Let us remember those words and what the Father went on to say at the transfiguration. Let us hear what He said this Friday. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. This one who acts like God. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to the mystery of the cross, we thank you that we discover in your powerlessness power, in your vulnerability the absolute exemplification of love seen and demonstrated in the cross. May that become the ground of our being, the source of our life. We pray in your name. Amen.